Kumenya mute neko umenya kuma meri, madhago na mahuti na kinya mahua maguo. Dore hede oge menya roga norogi maru wa muti oshio, otabe ite kumenya roga norogi maru wa meri na madhago na kinya mahua maguo. This was actually a victory for ordinary Kenyans. In my view, when I look at that election, of our new nation. It's almost as if the individual candidates did not matter, as long as one stood for change, one had a pretty good chance of winning. One has to be as absolutely poor as most Kenyans are to know uh, why Kenyans uh, thought this was so important in event. Because they think that now is the time to see an end to their problems. The problems they have endured for the last 24 years, the problems that they have endured for the last 40 years, Probably the problems that they have endured for the last 70 years since the colonial government was set up in this country. to see where we're coming from so as to see where we're going to we got to know who is who in struggle so as to know where we are in struggle and to take a walk a brief walk to history <laughs> hey 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 don't forget your history when I compare and write about our past, I really mean to refute a claim that is often made in history books written from the West that the colonialists came to save Africa from themselves, uh, to save us from inter so-called intertribal wars, to save us from hunger. All this is nonsense. Facing Mount Kenya by Jomo Kenyatta, he points out very strongly that our society before um, the colonialists came to Africa or to Kenya um, were in fact uh, happy societies, uh, that we had a, a system that uh, gave people enough food, um, they had a socio-political system that guaranteed their rights, a system or, uh, that we called Itwika, which means generations handing over power to the generations after them. And this was a very democratic system, which the British ended because obviously it was subversive to the system, to the colonial system. By 1948, Almost 20,000 Africans, mainly those Kikuyu, was affected by European seizure of their land in the Central Highlands, went to the forests around Mount Kenya to begin a fight to reclaim their land. 
It's like a rebellion has shaped my entire existence. Not only was I conceived in it, I grew up in rebellion, the same time that Mama was actually being, being born. To begin with, uh, probably one thing that most people may not know is that Ma the freedom fighters in Kenya never called themselves Mau Maus. Mau Maus strike not only at Europeans, their own people are often among their victims. Thick woods and jungle have to be penetrated to find the murderers. The objective of this secret society is to drive all white men out of Kenya. All who carry the mark of the Mau Mau must be hunted out so that peace may come to this troubled colony. It is the British who called them Mau Maus, which was supposed to be a derogatory term or a term to demonize people fighting for, for freedom. But as the usage, you know, uh, of the name continued. Uh, people actually adopt, you know, they kept the name and with pride and suddenly gave it a different meaning, uh, saying that uh, uh, Africa, um, Muzungu Arudi Ulaya, Muafrika Pate Uhuru, that is, the white man should return to Europe for the African to get his independence. That was supposed to be the purpose for the struggle for independence. On October 20th, 1956, we heard that Field Marshal Dedan Kimathi leader of the Mau Mau freedom fighters had been captured. Everywhere, military and police helicopters dropped leaflets carrying the information and a picture of Dedan Kimathi on a stretcher and in handcuffs, surrounded by his white captors. He looked greater than our enemies. Or was it all in our eyes? Fire, 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 fire. This power that is uh, the, 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 the government. We want to rule our country. When we became independent and Kenyatta became uh, the leader of the independent Kenya, uh, he came out of uh, prison with a desire more to appease the settlers who had put him in than to actually deliver to the African people what they had been fighting for. We believe that the Kenya is large enough. Kenya potentiality is great. And all of us, and I'm not telling you this because I'm in your meeting, I'm telling you what I believe and what my government believes. That white, brown, black can work together harmoniously in this country and make this country great. So it didn't take long for people to realize that in a fact, uh, failure for Africans to get back the land which they had bled for, the land for which they had been imprisoned, detained, killed, was a betrayal. The same structures of government that had been left behind by the colonialists were the same structures that were inherited. People began to feel that something more was needed. I remember when I came to America in 1971, I was coming because coming here was a passport to a good life. This, was, this country was a hotbed of uh, then the civil rights 
uh, movement. People were opposing the government, you know, crying for more rights, saying racism was bad. I know that for sure that the Mau Mau and the struggle for independence in Africa was an inspiration to the uh, to the African Americans. The police look mighty hard. So we thought we saw that the first thing to do was to unite our people, not only unite us internally, but we have to be united with our brothers and sisters abroad. I remember listening to Malcolm X, uh, to his speeches, and I know that uh, in a lot of his speeches he makes reference to the Mau Mau in admiration. This is true, the Mau Mau played a major role in bringing about freedom for Kenya, and not only for Kenya, but other African countries, because what the Mau Mau did frightened the white man so much in other countries until he said, well, I better get this thing straight before some of them pop up here. And uh, this is good to study because you see what makes him react. And when one part of humanity is fighting for freedom, they are fighting for and on behalf of the others. I got an insight into what life under freedom is all about. And having experienced it here, uh, I, had no, I had no greater desire than to see the same in Kenya. So I went back, I quit school, went back to Kenya to fight for, uh, for democracy. For me, the only questions that needed debate were questions of tactics. How should I begin the fight? How best do I advance it? How would my ideas reach the people? Immediately when I got home, I realized that I didn't have a platform. So I started going around my place looking for problems to expose. I wrote articles about people forming companies uh, that were mandated to buy land for them because the government had refused to give them land after independence. The misfortune of the people, these companies were led by most corrupt individuals, people who took the money and went and bought themselves land instead. It so happened that I was raising this point at a, at a particular moment when Kenyatta, uh, our first president, had declared that all of us would, with violence would, would be hanged. And then I, I posed the question, who are the more dangerous robbers? Who deserved to be hanged? The people who are robbing billions from the people or poor people who are robbing a hundred shillings from the people? Who was the more dangerous? Who deserved to be hanged? And the people thought that uh, just questioning Kenyatta was, uh, was, was um, overdoing my, my rebellion and they reacted very strongly. I came to the conclusion that there was something about journalism that wasn't quite right as a weapon of struggle. I didn't enjoy any protection as a journalist. And it was at that point that I said, I want to join politics. I want to go to parliament, become my people's representatives and, and representative and speak from there with parliamentary immunity. And so I contested uh, the 1974 elections. But even after they had rigged the election and this opponent beat me, ended up beating me with only 800 votes, they were so scared by my performance that they you know, they decided that they, they needed to get rid of me. Jen 
Kariuki was a popular young politician and former freedom fighter who spoke out against the greed and nepotism of his government. Doused in sulfuric acid and teeth knocked out. His fingers were cut and his penis severed and put in the pocket of his coat. The independence that J.M. fought so hard for has turned into the poison that killed him. Uh, J.M. was assassinated and uh, when he was assassinated um, uh, I was among the people that was picked up, put into detention uh, with the purpose of scaring me into giving up. Uh, I went into detention not knowing what detention was. But when they arrested me, I was taken to commit a maximum security prison, which I thought was just a transit area, until when I was being taken across the corridor, I, I saw this a chain on echo, and I, I recognized his face, because he, he, this was a, a, a famous freedom fighter. He, by then, he had, been, he had been detained by Kenyatta for five years. And I did not suspect that he could be in prison. When I saw his face, I tell you, it was, I got a shock. Because I knew that, in fact, I was now in detention. And detention was a prison inside the prison. It was a double prison. So uh, I was kept under this solitary confinement. That was such a trauma that I actually thought it was going to kill me. I asked a Cheng Oneko, Mze, how have you survived for 10 years of detention under the British and then Kenyatta? He said, young man, this is a hard place and I have seen it break many. To survive here, you have to avoid going to war with the stone walls. Your real enemy is not these stone walls, but those who brought you here to be broken by them. Isolation and confinement breaks people faster than anything. Cultivate the friendship of the Askaris. They will tell you what is going on outside and break the isolation they are here to enforce. We came out after Kenyatta had died and an election was due uh, and in fact Moy invited me. He, I was invited to his, to his house and I was asked whether I wanted to take part in the elections and I said sure. At that point uh, we sort of belonged to the same side because he had been an underdog under Kenyatta. But no sooner had I gone into parliament and he started raising issues that he himself was speaking about publicly. Then he started to fight me. Moy himself had said in a public meeting that the prices of land needed to be reduced to 500 shillings an acre. And so when I went to parliament, I, I drafted a motion calling upon the government to reduce the prices of land and also uh, create a ceiling of land ownership so that people there will not be people owning say a hundred thousand acres of land when others owned nothing he ended up calling me to his house uh, together with the uh, Duta, my wife and uh, uh, he gave me a lecture uh, for nearly one hour we had breakfast together telling me that i should uh, 
I should let sleeping dogs lie. My little bird, you must sing with me. This is how the country will move forward. The day you become a big person, you will have the liberty to sing your own song and everybody will sing it too. But in the meantime, I went back to parliament and started doing exactly what I had done before. I had to ask the questions that I had failed to ask as a journalist. I didn't know by so doing I was going to be stepping on very powerful toes. Let me say, I, I wasn't part of the coup, but we had done everything in parliament and in government to invite the coup. We had just turned the country into a one-party state by removing the constitutional provision that permitted people to start opposition parties. And I remember how uh, tense parliament was, the great fear that pervaded parliament when we were passing that bill. Everybody was aware that we were actually committing national suicide. So when the coup happened, when I heard about the coup at home, I said, I wish they succeed. But I had nothing to do with it. I was not involved, but for the government, it was just the pretext they needed now to come for me. And indeed, five days after the coup, they came for me and they took me to the mortuary to view the hundreds of people that had been killed in the aftermath of the coup. In fact, they said, this is what you wanted, now you are happy. I said, I, 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 I never wanted people killed. I was only asking the government to do the right thing, and he said, there's no difference. Asking the government to do the right things and having people killed, you are responsible. The 1992 coup was a turning point. Apparently shaken by the challenge, the president sought to reassert his authority by detaining hundreds of critics and opponents. From 75 August, when I was uh, uh, put in, I was immediately put under solitary confinement and it turned out to be a very difficult form of imprisonment. I was alone, uh, but there is one thing that saved me, the fact that uh, uh, many guards were sympathetic. A prison guard uh, told me, you know, you will survive this detention because we too are in it and we have survived. And that kind of encouragement did a lot to help us survive. And then in December of 1984, I was set free. Uh, again, they set you free without telling you what they, they want you to do, not to be brought back into prison. Their hope is that you have felt such a pain that you are not there fight for freedom again, that to remain outside, you will surrender freedom. But then as fate would have it, um, the person who became MP instead of me committed suicide. And when this suicide happened, people came to me and they said, you know, this was something from God. God wants you to go back into parliament. And I was stupid enough, I think, to believe this. So I said, I'm going to contest. The games being played with dictatorship were creating extreme poverty among the people. A system of patronage in which leaders owe their position to the president became pervasive and was most apparent during the elections. When we went to count for the vote counting, we found a whole army stationed outside the counting hall, the GSU, armed with, you know, uh, is it called riot gear? And we knew 
that the election was, was rigged. There was no other reason the army could be there, the GSU, the police, fully dressed for battle. Uh, people became so disappointed after the rigging that for the first time I saw people tearing up their voting cards and saying, we will never vote again if this is what elections are all about. In 1986, an underground movement called Mwakenya began publishing a pamphlet called Pambana. It criticized the government over the destitution and desperation that corruption was causing amongst Kenyans. The authorities claimed a massive plot to overthrow the government and sold culprits. I was also receiving uh, very, you know, very grave threats from the people in power. And we called a family meeting and we debated, you know, what, what would we do given the seriousness of these threats? And we decided that the best thing is to escape into exile. time you used to talk anything political or even discuss anything you'd have to look over your shoulder. They moved me blindfolded to Parkland's police station where I was heard until evening. When it got dark they brought a Land Rover, blindfolded me and pushed me into that Land Rover and brought me down here. And out of 74 days I was not given any food or water for 24 days. And uh, it was terrible. It was terrible. And there was hot air. Sometimes it would become very cold. Very cold. And then here up, they used to burn, they used to burn something, I think. Uh, and lucky enough, I was a Catholic. And whenever they would burn this thing, I would also sit with their burning so that I don't break up. So what used to happen is they would uh, blindfold you from the cells. And then they would lead you by your hands like you lead a, a, a blind person. And bring you here to these lips. These lips would then go with you up to the 25th story. And then uh, there on top, they would walk with you. The attic of the Nyayo house is where they were throwing people from and uh, saying that they were committing suicide. This place was very dark. Uh, they beat me with the blunt objects, meat, uh, whips, on a nipigao kuchini. So all the way. <laughs> My back was broken. The joints had been disconnected through the physical torture. Operation Demetrius. I came to learn later on that that is the system, what they call uh, the British system of that torture has been adopted in our country here. This policeman told me that under the command of Opio, they are actually the eyes of Nyayo. And that is why they are in Nyayo house. I don't know what, he, what they actually meant by that. I was taken to court. Uh, and when we went to court, the funny thing about the court was the people who are there, they are the same people who are beating me, and the people are not allowed to go into the court. So that again you find that you are now again caged. You know, you cannot escape because uh, it's not a public court. I have no alternative because I want to defend my life. I don't want to die like you. I plead guilty, but I have something to say. Then in 1990, I was so homesick that I visited Uganda. I went all the way to the border, Busia, hoping to meet my cousin there. Uh, and I remember that after, after, in the second day of my being at the hotel, it's called the Equator Hotel, I remember seeing people who looked like Kenyans, uh, you know, sitting next to me. And I went back into, the, into my room most people about five six you know a group of them they stormed into the room and knocked me down and when i woke up it was inside your house Bye. 
Outside, years of struggle were beginning to pay off. Kenyans were finding their voice, demanding better protection of human rights and forcing the government to reinstate opposition parties. With elections due by the end of 1992, Kenyans were exuberant. But across the country, violence only increased. Land clashes in the west of Kenya left 2,000 dead. Those targeted came mainly from communities likely to vote against the ruling party. A human rights crisis was developing. and 52 Kenyans remained in prison for their political beliefs. But the government was in denial. If you win, will you release the last seven political prisoners? There's no, who are, who are the political prisoners? Would you tell me? Koigi Wawamwari. If he committed crime, which is not political, which is, it's not political. I don't regard it as a political prisoner. Will you stop torture in Yayo House? There was a political prisoner who was released two Who weeks told you uh, we tortured somebody? Have you, have you gone to Nyayo House yourself? But we interviewed somebody to, um, who's or what you, two or weeks what? ago who was tortured last year. Who? Oh, it is what you are being told, my gracious lady. Nudo <laughs> Nigeria uh, fortunately, our mothers uh, decided to come um, at, at the place called Freedom Corner inside Uhuru Park. And almost the entire opposition started to rally behind them. Not just to express support for our leaders, but to call for greater changes, to call for a restoration of the multi party system. They went on a hunger strike and they fought for our freedom uh, in a way that only um, a hen whose chicks are about to be stolen by a hawk will fight. Uh, they fought a battle. In Kenya this week, police used tear gas and clubs to disperse a group of women hunger strikers demanding the release of political prisoners. Kenya's KTN was there when police moved in on the demonstrators. Angered by the brutality, the mothers stripped naked, a curse in African tradition. That night, the women were forcibly evicted by policewomen and scores of heavily armed policemen and taken to their home districts while police took over Freedom Corner. Kathleen Appenda, KTN, for the CNN World Report. Uhuru Park, Nairobi. The action sparked two days of riots in Nairobi and brought condemnation by Western governments. Their camp became such a magnet that finally the government was forced to concede. And in January 1993, 
we were actually released. tribal person, a non-partisan person, a very humane person. He's just the opposite. The tribal clashes, when they came, they came to fulfill his prophecy that multi-partisan would bring tribal clashes in this country. You know, we came out, uh, then the country had been, a uh, multi-party system had come, and I remember people asking us, telling us, this is what you fought for. And indeed, it's what we had been fighting for. But we asked them, whom do we have as a midwife uh, to deliver democracy into this country again? It is the same nurse that had killed it before, Moi. And three brothers, myself, and the other people who are now all being charged with this uh, under this one capital charge. It was a shocking trial because evidence was uh, fabricated from, uh, from the pettiest to the gravest. The judgment was read for us in prison one of us was released and three of us were convicted. Finally, actually, I fell ill and I was taken to Nairobi Hospital. I was very scared. Then, you know, as my mother had done before, one day she came to see me and when she was not allowed to see me, she decided to camp, to pitch camp right on the corridor of the in, in, the, in the corridor of the hospital. And um, as time went on, more and more people started coming there and it became another center from which pressure was being put on the government to release us. Finally, uh, the government accepted to release me on bond for me to go to, for treatment abroad. You have to to be really happy if it's true that he is free and uh, this is what we have been waiting for. I'm out of prison, but he's still a prisoner who is only out on bond. There are still political prisoners in our stinking jails and violations of human rights happen daily in Kenya. Freedom and justice continue to be a distant dream for all Kenyans but few. We were trying to get the government to hear the appeal we had filed against as our conviction and sentence. The government would not budge. Um, and this made me decide to contest not just the parliament for a parliamentary seat, but also for the presidency. I chose to run, uh, not so much to win, uh, but to make the point. Allow me to simply stand, contest, you know, taste the fruit, the sweet fruit of telling Moi, I want to beat you, I want you a job, without having to go to prison. I contested, I lost, then almost immediately, the second round of ethnic fighting clashes came. <laughs> They came at about 8 a.m. They were armed with guns. They robbed the shops. A number of those fleeing the area were people originating from up country who claimed they were being targeted by the attackers. Before and after the general elections in 1992, Kenya had the so-called tribal clashes. After 
the general elections in 1998, Kenya again has the so-called tribal clashes. The main reason for these massacres is to draw new internal and ethnic boundaries for Kenya. But Kenya is a multi-ethnic state where Kenyans from all ethnic communities live together. The 2002 election was destined to be different. After a decade of multi-party elections, Kenyans appeared better aware of their responsibilities and rights. President Moy nominated Uhuru Kenyatta, one of Jomo Kenyatta's sons, to succeed him and urged Kenyans to back his choice. Unhappy with this selection, some members of the ruling party left and joined the opposition. For the first time in Kenya's history, the majority of the opposition back a single candidate, Mwai Kibaki, as their presidential nominee. I, for one, wasn't so sure that uh, the elections would be as smooth as they turned out to be. I wasn't too sure that uh, the people would rise as they did in their millions. This time around, I think for me and for many Kenyans, we know what we're voting for. We know that we're making a change at the end of the day. Did you vote here at hospital here? Yeah? I voted here. Okay. Just voted. Just, just now? You just, just finished? Now. Yeah. So the ink is still wet? It's still wet. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think the future holds a lot of uh, good change. Compared to last time, most people are more enlightened about what will happen. I'm very much impressed. I'm here as an uh, election official, facilitating to bring in a new government. There is nothing more eligible than that. Under the scrutiny of 40,000 election observers and round-the-clock media coverage, the election proved to be a model for Africa and elsewhere. Uh, then we got results from Mali that I had passed. And in fact, by morning, it was clear that uh, President Kibaki was way ahead of Uhuru. Honorable Mike Kibaki has majority votes. He also has, he, he has also scored over 25 percent votes of the registered voters in seven out of the eight provinces. Uhuru considered defeat, and he knew that in fact we had uh, uh, come to the end of an era. The Moi era was over. Moy has stolen elections so many times that it was impossible to believe that he could give this country the gift of a free and fair election. Why did he do this? Probably there was a lot of pressure from his former supporters in the West. They may have told him, no, the game is up. This time you've got to do it right, or else we, we will give you no support. It could very well be, as the Kikuyu proverb says, the one who, who is chased and the one who chases both get tired. Probably Moi had reached the end of his road. He too was tired and he wanted to. I believe that it is very important that we look at the truth of our history. However ugly, look at it, face it. And then ask ourselves, why did this happen? How can we avoid this happening again? You have seen that the places we have visited this morning are not really meant for human beings. And it is important 
that this nation know that we represent a multitude of Kenyans that have bled over the years, that have lost their lives. People are talking of compensation. People are talking of reconciliation and justice and forgiveness. We can forgive them, but we cannot forget something which has sunk so much inside our memories. I think the experience we encountered in this cell will only pass when if everybody of us here dies. Yakwamba, you are a son. Zilikuwa ni fimbo. Yakupigana na udiktator katika inchi hii. Niata kumi na miwili. Ilio pita. Nikiwa katika jela ya kamiti. Tuliomba vitana ndiyo tuweze kuchanyua nyuele. Tuka katazwa. Tuka ambiwa jela hakuna vitana mutaka hivi. honeymoon is now over. We have removed Moy. It's now time to root out dictatorship and its structures. <laughs> I think people, our people, are patient and they will be willing to give this government time to do it. But we have to demonstrate to the people that we are on the right path, that we are moving in the right direction. Hey! 